to take you guys through the rainforest. See how it works? It's we spare no expense here. We go right into the rainforest. It's Seattle, South America. Seattle, South America. You get the idea? Take you guys out there. I'm going to turn you from echo tourists into field researchers today. Although I should point out, if you're really going to go down to the South American rainforest sometime, you're really going to want to lose the shorts and the open-toed shoes, because about 80% of all the insects on the planet live in the rainforest, so it's sort of like, you know, you're wearing a Happy Meal box, basically. Come and get me! But that's all right, we're gonna let that pass. Next time you guys come down, we'll, we'll work on getting you the proper gear. Uh, I'm gonna sharpen your observation skills today. I want you guys to take a look at where you're standing, right here in front of a giant old kapok tree, well, at least what's left of one. This tree might have been 200 feet tall at one time. Could have been as old as four or 600 years. It's kind of hard to tell because it's a softwood tree. It doesn't get those rings like the hardwood trees do, so you really can't tell how old a tree like this would be. But uh, what's really amazing about it is these buttress roots that go out in all different directions. And this young gentleman was just showing me before how, uh, we, how a tree like this stays stable. You want to show us over here again? If you're a 200 foot tall tree and you're in a rainforest that has very poor soil and a wind comes along, what's going to happen? Over he goes, right? And then show us what a kapok tree does. See? Much more protected. Thank you for helping me. That's great. See, so basically that's how this tree keeps from falling over and um, does a pretty good job of it. Now what's really interesting is you notice how it's hollow on the inside? A lot of people would think that happened after the tree fell down, it died, it rotted out. And uh, that's why we have this tree like this now. But the part of the tree that's alive is the outside of the tree. That's the part that continues to grow. The inside of the tree can be completely hollow and it'll still continue to grow. So why would a tree be hollow in a rainforest? I'll give you a hint. Everything in the rainforest is competing for light, for nutrition, for all kinds of things. It's a big competition, a real big battle for resources. The soil in the rainforest is pretty poor. It's all tapped out. So why would a tree be hollow on the inside? What might move in to an old, hollow, cavernous tree? Anybody? What do you think? An animal. Animal. See, you got it. Please. They have these bugs on people. Yep. And they also go in there because there's a very important reason. They actually help out the tree. Now, what sort of animal might live in a thing like a cave? What kind of animal that likes to be in the dark? Might be something that flies. See, the grown-ups are going to make you do all the work. See that? She got it right. She said a bat. High five. Give me a high five. There you go. See, now you just taught all these people what animals live in here. Isn't that pretty remarkable? That's right. Inside of this tree, you might have had two or three hundred bats at any given time. And what are they doing when they're up there? They're eating. Yeah, but there's something else they're doing. They're pooping. That's right. They're dropping their guano. That guano is full of nitrogen, and it is fertilizing the tree from the inside. At night, the bats also fly out, and they pollinate the fruit of the kapok tree. So basically, the bats are working for a living. You know, they, they're paying their rent. Now, when a tree like this falls down, remember, 200-foot tall tree, lots of strangler fig vines wrapped around it. You have a... Uh, a great big hole will open up in the canopy of the jungle and all of this light will start to stream in and all of these different opportunistic plant species will start to move in as well. And as I make my way through the echo tourists, I can show you some of these plants, particularly this one. This is a kind of epiphyte. It's a plant that lives on something else. You notice it's not growing down in the ground. It could just be growing on the side of a tree like that. A tree, a plant like this could grow on the side of a rock. It doesn't have much of a root system. It doesn't need one. Check it out. This is where it stores its water, right on the inside of the plant. See that? Check it out, right inside there. So basically, basically right inside of that plant, it's got a little cup system, just like this. And all of the rain falls inside of that cup system, and it collects, and inside of standing water, what do you get? What kind of things live in standing water? Anybody know? Come on, you guys are from the Northwest. You should know the answer to this, some of you guys. What? Moths. Moths? No. Moss? No. Think insects. What do you see in there? You got it. Mosquitoes, absolutely. So there'll be mosquito larvae living on inside of the puddle there. And what lives on mosquitoes and mosquito larvae? You know, an animal that likes to eat bugs? What's a good bug-eating animal? Spiders, yeah, that's true. What's an amphibian that likes to eat bugs? 
I'm not an amphibian. You got it. Frogs. High five. Check it out. What we, what we have in the rainforest, we have these um, poison dart tree frogs. You ever see those? They're really bright colors. The male poison dart tree frog will put a tadpole on his back and climb up and put that tadpole right inside of the bromeliad and it will eat the mosquito larva. You guys are starting to get the connections, right? Everything lives in the rainforest and they compete with one another. Everything is working together. Everything is recycling. And whenever you have a big chain of events like that, there's always somebody on the top. There's always a top predator, the jaguar. In the rainforest of South America, Central America, and Mexico, you will find the jaguar, but you may never see one. You'll hear them. You'll see their tracks. You'll find their scratch marks. You'll find their scat, and they'll see you but you won't see them. And that's why you have to have some tricks in the trade, and I'm gonna show you how we do it. I'm gonna have you guys help me. We're gonna follow the Jaguar's tracks right into the rainforest. Right, whoa, as soon as this truck goes by. You know. <laughs> see, just when you're going through a rainforest, somebody puts in a timber road. Come on, guys, I'm gonna show you guys. Hey, find the track, the Jaguar. You have to have researchers with me now. All right, I'm gonna have you guys make a big circle out here so you can see a little better. He put his paws here, and he went, okay, all right. Okay, guys, step back just a little bit. Step back just a little bit. Tell me what you see here. What do you see? Scratch marks, absolutely. See, jaguars have claws like this. Very big, wicked, fish hook looking claws. Look at the size of that claw. See that? And the jaguar will use a claw like that He'll use all of his claws to scratch on trees. Do you guys have house cats that do this at your sofa at home? Did you know that that was a territorial marking telling you that that was his couch or her couch? That's what they're doing. Jaguars are solitary animals. They do not want the competition. They don't want anybody around stealing their food, taking away the other animals that they hunt. So what they do is they scratch a tree like this to let the other jaguars know this is my territory, stay out. Think of it as sort of jaguar graffiti. Another way that jaguars mark their territory is scat. So you want to watch where you're walking while you're in the rainforest, right? Okay, now I'm going to take you guys to see some other tracks of another animal that jaguars like to hunt. You guys will follow me up the trail a little bit to show you some of the animals. On the other side, we're going to make a great big open circle here. You grown-ups can move in. That's okay. Hey, he's checking out the bromeliads up there, huh? Pretty interesting. Okay, now, what kind of animal do we have here, gang? Anybody have any guesses? What do you think? I don't know that. Say that nice and loud. Peccary. Peccary. Yep, absolutely. Peccary. Now, a lot of times people will be looking at tracks like this, they'll see hooves and they'll think deers or horses, but the truth of the matter is, is if an animal has long legs like a deer, they would have a longer stride, right? So if you have these short strides like that, that'd be like a deer going like this. Nobody walks like that, right? So basically it's an animal with short legs and it's a much shorter animal, so you've got a peccary or uh, also they call them javelina, and uh, it's a hoofed animal and it's got very short legs. And you've got two here. One, two, three, four paws here. One, two, three, four paws there. So we have two peccaries, or javelina, going through the rainforest by themselves, away from the rest of their herd. I'm going to guess they're adolescents, because these guys seem to know everything. They're not going anywhere near the rest of the group. Now let's follow them around and see where they went. Let's go around to the other side of this planet. Check it out. Oh, let's make a great big, let's make a great big loop here. Great big loop. Okay, how many animals, how many peccaries did we see going in the other side? Anybody? Two. Two. There were two on the other side. How many came out? One. And whose track is this? Now, see, a green field researcher might be tempted to believe that one of those peccaries turned into a jaguar. That would not be correct, nor is he riding piggyback on the jaguar's back. All right, I will tell you something I do know about these tracks. This animal came out first. You ever notice that, those old movies where a guy puts his ear down to the ground and says, oh, four horses came south, southwest, and you go, how does he know that? How could he possibly know that? Well, the truth of the matter is, if you know how to track animals, you learn about these little logical things. When an animal walks, it leaves its smell on the ground. This is a major predator. The biggest predator in the rainforest, right? Don't you think a peccary would know
know what he would smell like? So if this guy came through here first, this peccary would have smelled him on the ground. He would have made a great big circle out of the way. So basically, this guy came out first. And then when this one came out, he's not hunting the other one. He's not hunting that peccary because if he was hunting him, his tracks would be right inside of these tracks. He'd have his nose down to the ground, smelling that peccary where it went through. So why would a great big jaguar not hunt a juicy little peccary like that? What do you guys think? Anybody have a suggestion? Well, we would have seen his tracks. He wasn't a flying pig, is he? I don't think so. What else? thinks that maybe the jaguar ate the other peccary. That's a very good assumption. But you know, in science, you really don't say an absolute conclusion unless you have all the evidence. And here's what we don't know. We see his tracks of the jaguar going out. But what we don't see is his tracks going in. So we need to find a set of tracks where the jaguar walked in. So I need you guys to sort of look around and see if you can... All right, okay, all right, let's move back a little bit here. Move back a little bit. You guys see tracks between here and there? Okay, and also, you notice that at the end of the toe, there's a little mark there, a little mark like a claw, like that, like we showed you before. All right, now I'm going to give you a hint. The name for the jaguar, the Indian word for jaguar is yagura. It means the killer that takes his prey with a single jump. About 12 feet. So what happened to that other peccary? That's right. And how a jaguar hunts is they wait very quietly, hidden by the bushes. So when those two peccaries were walking through the woods, it sounds like an old joke, two peccaries were walking through the woods, they came through here, they didn't see the jaguar, they didn't smell the jaguar, and he waited. And when one of those peccaries turned around, turned his back, like that, the jaguar jumped, anchored himself with those great big claws, like so, and bit right through the top of the skull, because that's what jaguars do when they hunt. And then the other peccary went wee, wee, wee all the way home. And then, when the jaguar was finished eating, he walked out. Now, you know, if you were in the field, you might sometimes find the scat of the jaguar. It might have a whole peccary hoof. Not a pleasant job, but somebody's got to do it, right? And also they can find sometimes their turtle shells and also armadillo shells. You know how armadillos have that shell, right? The jaguar's jaw strength is so powerful, he's got a bite strength almost as powerful as an alligator or a crocodile for his size. So his jaws are so powerful that an armadillo shell is like a crunchy taco. And what does an armadillo do when he is threatened, when he's afraid? What does he do? We always get the same answers from this guy over here. Some of you guys know the answer. We'll let, let them get it right. Does anybody know what, the, what they do? What do they do? They what? They jump, the armadillo? Um, they, they might jump when they're startled, but then they do something else that's protective. What else? What do they do? She got it. They roll up into a ball. They roll up into a convenient ball of meat. It's a great, it's a great tactic if you're not fighting a jaguar, you're not a way Jaguars will bite right the shell. So anyway, so that's what that's what they'll eat. Now another thing that we use to find out about jaguars in the wild, because we can't tell one jaguar from another from his tracks necessarily, unless he's got like a crooked toe or something. We have things like this. This is a camera trap. And this is how we study a jaguar out in the wild. We will bungee cord this trap down to a tree, kind of where we see the jaguar's tracks, because we know that they're going to be there. And then... There's a little infrared signal right here on the front, and what happens is when the animal goes through, it breaks the beam, and it takes his picture, and it time stamps it and date stamps it so that we know when these animals have moved through. And actually, what's really interesting is the pattern on a jaguar is different from every other jaguar. So their fur pattern is just like your fingerprint. And what we do to tell one jaguar from another we look at their field markers. The field marker on a jaguar is these little dots, which you see inside of the spot patterns. So dots inside of spots is the jaguar's field pattern, as compared to, say, a leopard, which has an open rosette pattern, and they live in another continent anyway. So you wouldn't really be confusing them with jaguars if you were in South America. So, this is some of the ways we do it. We also sometimes will radio collar an animal. We'll put a radio collar around his neck. You drug him first because he's not going to put on that radio collar just because it looks good with his fur, no matter how you compliment him. And 
and uh, they will go out into the wild, and then we follow the radio signal from that, and we compare that to the GPS satellite, and we can tell where the animal has moved, and that's one way we can protect the jaguars in the wild, by finding where they move and protecting those places where the jaguar would live. Now, that's one way of doing it. We also have um, right here our field research tent, and before you go today, I'm going to recommend you stop in there because we have photos from the camera trap in the tent. We also have some data from radio callers. We have some video of the four different research projects that the zoo supports. And by using your observation skills while you're in there, you might also notice the way that field researchers live. We've got a hammock in there with mosquito netting. It's the whole nine yards. So I'm going to move on over the, to that tent right now. But if you happen to be just moving on and going through the rainforest, remember, use your observation skills that I taught you about today. And remember how it takes an entire ecosystem to support a top predator like the jaguar. Those of you who are joining me in the tent, I'll be talking about how you guys can save the jaguar on the block. That's a leopard. That's because they have to worry about uh, other predators. Jaguar is the top of the food chain. Come on, guys. I'm going to bring you on into the, the, the field tent. You guys can come check it out. Oh, yeah. They're over there. Yeah, it's the same thing. Got some more tracks over here. Now, you know, I'll tell you, I think these must have happened a long time ago because I'm not too crazy about the idea of a jaguar going by my field research tent. Come on in, guys. There's lots of room in here. Check it out. We've got photos right here. Photos here in the in this thing here. We've got photos over here. You guys can see some of the photos from the camera trap that I was telling you about. There's a peccary skull. There's a jaguar skull. There's some data from a radio collar over here. It shows the movements of one jaguar over the course of several weeks and how he's moved through the rainforest. And we're going to talk a little bit about conservation, too. The zoo supports four different projects right now. The lady who's on TV right now is Patricia Medici. She's doing a project, uh, radio collaring tapirs. And uh, she sent us a letter when we started putting this exhibit together. She told us that she had a radio collar from a peccary. A jaguar ate the peccary and left tooth marks in the radio collar. And she was going to send it to us, but it was able. they were able to fix it. So it's out on a tapir somewhere. Shucks, that would have been a really great, uh, great thing for you guys to see. So this is the field tent. This is where you'd live if you were in a rainforest in South America. It's a little clean for a field research tent, but uh, you know it's a really nice one. And here's our hammock. This is where you would sleep if you were studying animals in the wild, and it would be a good way to not study animals like mosquitoes. <laughs> Bounce right off of this. The guy who invented this, he got malaria like seven times before he came up with this. I personally would like to think that I would have invented it after the fifth or sixth time I got malaria. So um, basically, now here's what we're going to talk about. I want to tell you about conservation. First of all, we have some very valuable resources. First, The first most valuable resource is this generation. You guys right here. You kids who are growing up, you're on the internet. How many of you guys go on the net? A couple of you guys, right? Okay, now when we were kids, this is one of those, when I was a young man kind of stories. When we were kids, we bought the same products that our parents always bought. And if we didn't know something, they'd tell us to look it up in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Or go to the library. You guys are on the web. So you can dis discover all the things about these different companies, about what kind of products that they're making, and how much of an impact it has on rainforests. And by your spending... Over the course of your lifetime, you guys can actually sort of retrain these companies so you can make sure that they, you buy only products that are ecologically friendly. Now, for the grown-ups, the best thing you guys can do is switch to shade-grown coffee. And if you're not a coffee drinker, tell your friends who drink coffee to switch to shade-grown coffee. The best way to get them to do it is give them some shade-grown coffee as a Christmas present or a birthday present because it tastes so much better than the other stuff. I'm a big coffee drinker, and I'll tell you, I can really tell the difference. The thing is, is that the rainforest, the biggest problem with the jaguar right now is deforestation. They keep cutting down major sections of the rainforest, and if you look at a coffee tree, it's like seven or eight feet tall, and the rainforest, the trees are 150 feet, the canopy. So does it make any sense to chop down all of those trees for trees that like the shade anyway? No. Also, when you plant all those trees together, you get a monoculture, and they don't have the natural pesticides that the other plants provide in the rainforest. You also don't get the fertilizers that because the, the, they're all sucking the same nutrients right out of the soil, so you got to fertilize them. And what happens in a rainforest? What's the main thing that happens? Right. So when it rains, what happens? 
washes all those chemicals right into the watershed. So by switching to shade-grown coffee, they have to walk a little further to harvest the beans, but you end up saving a lot more rainforest, and also the indigenous people who live there make a little bit better of a, a little bit of a better of a living. So I'm going to open this up for questions. If you guys want to look around at the different uh, artifacts and things like that, feel free to. We've got some video here uh, from the Amazon Conservation Team, which is a project, uh, Dr. Uh, Mark Plotkin's project, that um, we're helping to support by you coming to the zoo today, in fact. And uh, if you have any questions, just fire them off. That's what I'm here for. Thanks for coming on the program. That's why I realize is that the peoples of the rainforest are disappearing much faster than the rainforest itself. Oh, you're good. I think you guys have a career in the sciences here. What do you think? Who knows how many others disappeared? Every one of these tribes had the knowledge of our medicinal plants, and that knowledge has gone to be never to be. Every one of these plants that are out there, they all have compounds to protect them from insects, right? They're alkaloids mostly. That means, um, well, alkaloids are chemicals, and those chemicals react to our bodies a different way. So alkaloids are things like nicotine and caffeine, and those are all very powerful drugs in our system. So all of these plants, you know, have different chemical compounds that we don't know about. We know 1% of the plants that live in the rainforest. Imagine that. We know more about the stars in the sky than we know what's in the rainforest. So what plants that are out there might be the cure for diseases that we don't know about? We don't know. And if we keep chopping them down, we're never going to find out, right? So this is a shaman's apprentice program. Look at these kids. They're learning how to be shaman from the jaguar shaman. They're teaching them how to... How to uh, learn about the medicinal plants that they can bring back to their village. The best way to preserve the rainforest is having people that live there help us preserve it, right? So that's what that's what this program does, ACT. And that's just one of those the programs that Zoo supports. Yeah, uh, basically the thing that's the biggest danger to the jaguar aside from us is things like bacteria and infections. An animal like that gets scratched on the rainforest and gets sick. Or sometimes they'll eat an animal that has worms or parasites or some kind of intestinal problem and then it'll pass on to the jaguar. So if you think about it, you have this top predator, he's got these great big teeth, he's very powerful, and yet a tiny little microbe might do some real damage to him. And in a way, we're a little bit like that, aren't we? I mean, we're predators in some ways, and we're the top of the food chain, and what knocks us out a lot of times? The same thing, right? Mm -hmm. So we have a lot in common with the jaguar. So by studying them, maybe we'll learn a little bit about us. Any other questions? Amazon conservation team is dedicated to the ancient shamanic culture of the 21st century as well. I got guys mapping their traditional lands using GPS. It's cutting edge technology. See, in the past, the waters would come in and say, Where do you live? And they'd roll out their map. Yeah. Yeah. Stamps for your passport books? You have any other passport books? Yeah. 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 Thanks, guys. Take some time to check out the rainforest. Oh, and this is how it's over here.